So what we shall next start with is the topic called inner products and inner product spaces. But I must warn you at the very outset that up until this point, whatever we have dealt with, barring a very few exceptions where we have pointed it out to you, everything was over general fields. So anything that satisfies the definition of a field, you can just fly with it and go ahead and plug those results and they'll hold without any loss of generality. The moment we get into inner products, however, we have to restrict ourselves to just R and C. So our F, that's the first most important thing that you have to remember, is either R or C and none of those other fields that you might have seen like those finite fields and so on. And there's a reason why uh, this is important or rather we will not be invoking any property of the fields apart from those which come inherently with R and C. Okay, there's a reason why. Well, it will be clear once we define what an inner product is. Most of you have a feel for what an inner product is because of your first brush with uh, Euclidean spaces. You might think of inner products as something that signify angles between vectors, right? Now here's the deal. If you take, even without getting into definition of inner products, let's say you understand what inner product is. Think of them like dot products on Euclidean spaces. If you take the inner product or the dot product of a vector with itself and the vector happens to be a non-zero vector, what do you expect to get? And, and not, just, not just positive number, but also an idea about the length of the vector, right? And lengths obviously, as you know, have to be positive, right? But now, if you think of, say for example, the binary field, and you take this. Now, of course, this is not a zero vector in the binary field by no stretch of imagination, right? But look at this. This is, so this idea of the length and all this, it just fails. You cannot push your luck through with this, right? So if we are considering Z2, the binary field, no longer does that idea carry forward. In fact, if you think of angles, like you know, even with a, without much sophisticated thought or understanding of inner products, you can think of these uh, dot products like some cosines of angles. But if you keep varying things constantly, you expect the cosines to vary continuously as well, right? But these are just some discrete points on the lattice. I mean, there aren't even points in between. When you think of a rotation, you are rotating a vector continuously. But here, there are just points on the lattice. You cannot just uh, go continuously and transit from one vector to another through a continuous path even, right? So those are several other, those and several other problems, they preclude the use of any field other than R and C for inner products. I think I had some hands raised there, yes. Sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's zero. Yeah, fundamental mistake. Thank you. It's going to be zero. Right. So this is obviously an inner product or a dot product of a non-zero with itself leading to zero. And it is exactly things like these that we want to rule out from any inner product. Okay. So now we will define an inner product and you will see that the one object that you're familiar with, that dot product, it just happens to be a special case of this inner product. Yeah, so what is the inner product? You take this. This is how we denote an inner product. This is the first argument, this is the second argument. All right, and it takes objects in the vector space so it's a binary and maps it to the field. The field could be again either R or C, okay? Satisfying the following properties. 
1, the inner product of v1 plus v2 with v3 is going to be v1 with v3 plus v2 with v3. Okay. Second, alpha times v1 with v2 is equal to, you can pull out the alpha outside, v2. Of course, here v1, v2, v3 belong to the vector space v. Here alpha belongs to the field and v1, v2 belong to the vector space. There's a second property. Together these two properties can be qualified as linear in first argument, right? That's what this means, right? It's just the classic definition of linearity. If you're just thinking of this as acting on the first fellow, keeping the second fellow fixed and varying the first fellow, it's just linearity, yeah? Third, V1, V2 is given by V2, V1, the complex conjugate thereof. So if you're dealing with the real field, conjugation has no effect. But if you're dealing with the complex field, then of course you have to flip the sign of the imaginary part. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and finally, Right? That's just the definition of the inner product. Nothing more than this. Nothing more or less. Everything else that comes is a consequence of these four points that appear in the definition of an inner product. You can go ahead and cook up your own inner product, name it after yourself, as long as it satisfies these four properties. <coughs> So this last property is what we will call positive definiteness. <clears throat> so what about the second argument? We have seen that the definition assures us that this is going to be linear in the first argument. If it is also linear in the second argument, we could have gone ahead and said that this is bilinear. But is it indeed bilinear? And if so, then under what special cases? Or is it always bilinear? These are the kind of questions that we should be asking ourselves because the definition seems to remain mum on the second argument, but it leaves a hint as to how we could probe through the third property. So if you want to find out what is the behavior of this uh, inner product with respect to the second argument, then probably we should go ahead and try to harness this, right? So let us uh, probe this. So let us consider V1 and V2 plus V3 as this. 
Now, directly we don't know if the, this is actually linear in the second argument. However, if we manage to bring it as the first argument, then we might be able to invoke the properties that have been described in the definition. So we can say this is nothing but the complex conjugate of v2 plus v3 and v1. Now conjugation is just you know an action on a scalar, doesn't really make much of a difference. So we can just say that this is the conjugation of v2 v1 plus v3 v1. So you know that conjugation of a sum is equal to the sum of the conjugation. Doesn't matter, it's just simple complex arithmetic that you've done in your plus two levels, yeah? So this is what? v2 v1 plus v3 v1, but that turns out to be, again if you flip, double conjugation is back to the same value again. So this is v1 v2 plus v1 v3. Remember this we didn't mention in the definition, but it's, it's a consequence of whatever's there in the definition. We've just used those properties in the definition. So it seems we are still on track towards pushing for bilinearity, are we? So there's yet another property that needs to be verified. So let's see what happens when we take V1 and alpha V2, where alpha belongs to the field. Again, by field, I'm only referring to R and C, nothing else, right? So this is what? This is equal to the conjugation taken over alpha V2, V1. Now, of course, what is this? This is nothing but alpha V2, V1, the conjugation of the whole thing Conjugation of products is product of conjugates. So again, this is nothing but alpha bar or alpha star if I call it that. And that's the problem, you see. Okay, let me retain the bar as the notation for conjugation, all right? So this is V2, V1 the whole conjugate, which is nothing but alpha bar times V1, V2. So this is what spoils the party. It is not really bilinear unless, unless the field is real. So if your field happens to be R, then it is indeed bilinear. If it is not, then it is sesquilinear, almost linear, but not quite. I mean, it meets half the property of linearity, which is this summation property. But when it comes to this homogeneity property or this scaling property, it fails. Not by much, but exactly by tweaking the number to its conjugate. But that's not linear, right? So this is sesquilinear if you're talking about the complex field, but it's bilinear if you're talking about the real field, right? So this is, note that this is all a consequence of whatever's there in the definition. We don't have to include this separately in the definition because these are all derivatives of the definition itself, right? So now let's look at some examples of inner products apart from, of course, the most natural dot product that you might have come across. So, okay, let's start with the most natural example. Say CN, okay, over C, right? And what we have is, let's say, V1, V2, like so, given by V1 transpose V2 conjugate, okay? You can go ahead and check that this 
meets those four properties. All right? Of course, V1 and V2 are objects that are n-tuples of complex numbers. Right? Go ahead and check that th there are those four properties alone that define an inner product and this satisfies those four properties. If you hadn't taken this conjugation, you would be in trouble. Where exactly would you have been in trouble if you hadn't taken that conjugation of the second argument? Where would the definition fall through? Sorry? I would say, what about the positive definiteness? So for example, again if you take 1 and i, 1 and i, right? Again you would be in trouble. This is 1 squared plus i squared is equal to 0. Whereas obviously this is not a 0 vector, right? So you have to take the conjugation. Now if you take the conjugation, no longer is this an issue because now you would have a minus sign here. And therefore, that changes matters completely. And it does give you an idea about the length of the vector as you understand it. Right? So you need this conjugation. Of course, if it's real, then whether you take the conjugation or not, it matters not. But in general, over n tuples of complex numbers, this is what the dot product or the inner product reduces to. But is this the only kind of inner product? Well, of course not. So let's do a bit of an exercise and see how far we can push our luck, right? So suppose you take uh, C2. Shall we take C2? Okay, let's take R2. The simplest case, let's take R2 cross R2 to R. How? In the following manner. So you have V1, V2, and you have V1 hat, V2 hat, right? This gets mapped to alpha times V1, V1 hat, plus beta times V1, V2 hat, plus gamma times V1 hat V2 plus delta times V2 V2 hat. Let us pose the problem in the following manner. We are interested in ans answering the question as to whether there do exist some suitable choices of alpha, beta, gamma and delta that allows us to call this a legitimate inner product. And through this process, we will understand two things. One, of course, that the kind of inner products that you're used to seeing are not the only ones that exist. And second, it will also strengthen our understanding of the definition because we'll be invoking all those uh, checks that we have defined in the description for the inner product in the first place, right? So that's the goal of this exercise. This is an exercise, okay? But we'll do it. All right. So, first things first, we have to ensure that what does this property, what property does this meet as a first check? If you take two different objects as the first argument, then the resultant sum, but is that not obvious from here? I would say that that first check, in fact, even the second check, the first two checks of linearity are actually quite obvious. Right? Linearity in the first argument is actually quite obvious. What we need to actually check is the third property. The first non-trivial property is the third property. Because the third property in this case, it's an inner product over the real field. So you don't need to take that conjugation. So if you flip the positions of the first and the second argument, you should still end up getting the same 
result, same resultant scalar, which means that, please ask if this is not clear, which means that the first condition that I should invoke here is that alpha v1 v1 hat plus delta v2 v2 hat plus beta v1 v2 hat plus gamma v1 hat v2 is going to be equal to alpha v1 v1 hat plus delta v2 v2 hat plus beta look the cross terms will change if you flip the order or the arguments then the cross terms will, will change so this will become v1 hat v2 plus gamma v2 hat v1 this must be true if the third point in the definition has to hold then this must be true isn't it but of course I can already get rid of certain terms so what does this mean yeah go ahead and check out what is common with beta and what is common with gamma it's the same thing right so what you have is beta minus gamma times v1 v2 hat minus v1 hat v2 must be 0 identically is it not this must be true for any arbitrary choice of the first vector and the second vector so in general this is not 0 in general this term is not going to vanish so the only way that you can ensure that this is 0 is by choosing beta is equal to gamma so you must choose beta is equal to gamma right so this leads us to conclude that beta must be equal to gamma right that is the first condition that we must choose so we cannot choose any arbitrary beta and gamma and things like this already you are seeing the effect of the definition the restrictions that are imposed by the definition you could not have chosen any arbitrary alpha beta delta gamma and called it a inner product at least beta has to be equal to gamma coefficients of the cross terms must match right what about the second next condition yes why we are swapping because we have the definition that v1 okay maybe don't confuse with this v1 huh? let's say we are taking some v1 and v2 inner product that's that must be equal to v2 v1 but because this is a real vector space i mean over a real field therefore this conjugation matters not so if this conjugation matters not i can get rid of this if i get rid of this then basically i would say that switching the locations of the first and second arguments does not matter which is what I have done. So if this is what it does to the first and second argument, then this is what it does to the second and first argument when they are flipped. And they must still be equal because of the third point in the definition of inner products. Clear? Okay. So that's the first observation. What about the positive definiteness? Right? Let's take a look at this we have alpha v1 v1 hat plus delta v2 v2 hat now that we know that beta is equal to gamma let me just call it the same right no point in carrying forward and calling them beta and gamma separately right so we can just say this is plus beta v1 v2 hat plus beta v1 hat v2 right yeah and also from this second term here alpha v1 v1 hat 
plus delta v2 v2 hat. Okay, let me not invoke the second term here. For positive definiteness, what do we need to do? We need to pass on the same vector as the first and second argument. So in that case, v1 is equal to v1 hat and v2 is equal to v2 hat, right? So if v1 is equal to v1 hat and v2 is equal to v2 hat, then we need what exactly? Alpha, because it is real, so I can just go ahead and square it. Alpha v1 squared plus delta v2 squared plus, this is now the same, right? v1 v2 twice beta v1 v2. And what must this be? Greater than or equal to 0, is it not? Because of the positive definiteness, right? Now, suppose v1 is not equal to 0. Then I can divide throughout by v1 squared, right? Then what do I get? Alpha plus delta times v2 upon v1 squared plus twice beta v1 upon v2 is greater than or equal to 0. Sorry? Ah, v2 upon v1, okay. Thank you. Right? So if this is the case, then what am I to infer? If I plug in v2 is equal to 0, then what must I have? For, and, and these are legitimate choices, right? Because this must be true for any arbitrary vector. So I have chosen one such vector where v1 is not equal to 0 and v2 is equal to 0. Right? Further, let v1, uh, sorry, v2 is equal to 0. Then I must have what? Alpha should be greater than or equal to 0. Similarly, by exactly the same reasoning and assuming v2 is not equal to 0, rather v1 is, we should also have delta is greater than or equal to 0. What is the other interesting thing that can happen? Sorry? Yeah, we can. But I mean, are we going to get some new results from there? So the first, let's say this is the second condition. And this is the third condition. So is this enough? That's the question. Right. Thank you. That's exactly what we are looking for. This quadratic thing here in V2 by V1, or if I like, I can flip it over by V1 by V2 and you'll check that the condition is the same. It should not have any roots. If it does, then it will violate this condition. No, it has to change sign then. So I need the discriminant of this quadratic term to be negative. So what is the discriminant of this quadratic term? Right? This is ax squared plus bx plus c. So I need the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac, which is 4 beta squared minus 4 alpha delta should be negative, which means beta squared should be less than alpha delta or alpha delta is greater than or alpha delta minus beta squared is greater than 0, right? I need strict inequality because if I have just equality, I'll have multiple roots. I don't want that to be the case. Sorry? Sign won't change, but I don't want 0 for something that is non-zero. I cannot tolerate 0 unless the vector itself is 0. So if I have a solution that is non-zero, that is also not acceptable to me, 
right? Now, just think about this. What is this? The way I have represented it, it may not appear very obvious, but what is this representation at the end of the day? Is this not the representation of the following form? Sorry? Yeah, it is the representation in this form. So you have V1, V2, and you have alpha, beta, beta, alpha times V1, V2. So what you are asking for is that this matrix that encapsulates this operation had better be symmetric, its determinant had better be positive, sorry, ah delta sorry, yes thank you. So this determinant had better be positive, yeah, and these terms individually should be non-negative, yeah, that would ensure that what you end up with is a legit inner product. Later on we will see that such matrices, the generalizations thereof, at least not necessarily only 2 by 2, the generalizations of these matrices are what we call positive definite matrices, right. So taken in by this idea, we will now give you another example of inner product. That is Cn cross Cn to C, which is given by 1 V2 that gets mapped to Or let's just take it real for the time being. Yeah, let's not mess things up with complex all the time. Yeah, so we'll not take the Hermitian. Okay, so this is what this inner product does with. Okay, go ahead and check that this is in general an inner product. Of course, the special case is when this is identity, then it is exactly what you are familiar with, right? When this A transpose A is identity, right? There are special classes of matrices called orthogonal matrices where U transpose U is identity, right? But you, you need not have that. You can have any generalization like so. And that's also going to be an inner product. We will see a few more examples of inner products over spaces that are a little more exotic in the next module.